Hello, welcome to this video series looking at the surface anatomy of the upper limb. In this first video, I'll be looking at the bones and muscles of the chest, shoulder and back. To get the most out of these videos, I'd recommend drawing along yourself. If you'd like to have a go, you can find a link to the images below. So, the first thing I want to do is find the bony landmarks on our skeleton, and then try to find those same landmarks on our figure. The first one I'm looking for is the clavicle, which will be this long bone here, passing from the sternum, and heading laterally to meet the scapula. More specifically, it will meet this bump of the scapula, which is the acromion process. Just inferior to the lateral end of the clavicle, we have our coracoid process, and then the greater and lesser tubercles are found at the proximal end of the humerus, our lesser tubercle medially, and our greater tubercle laterally. If we want to now find these landmarks on our figure, First I'd look for is the most prominent, the easiest to spot, the easiest to palpate, and this will be our clavicle along here. If you follow the clavicle along laterally, we should find a small bump just here, and this will be our acromion process of the scapula. The toratoid process is just inferior to that lateral end of the clavicle around here. Now you won't be able to see this on a patient but you should be able to palpate it. Finally, the greater and lesser tubercles. As we said before, they're hidden underneath muscles, so we won't be able to see these tubercles, but you should be able to palpate them about here and here. So now that we have these structures in place, the next thing we need to do is have a look at our muscles. So I'd like to start with this muscle here. This is the trapezius. This is a large muscle, and we see most of it on the back, but we do see some of it on this anterior aspect, and that's because it has this attachment anteriorly to the superior aspect of the clavicle. And that trapezius muscle will come down from the head, it forms the shape over the top of the shoulders, and attaches to our clavicle about halfway along. Now a healthy trapezius should form this shape over the top of the shoulder. If a patient loses function to their trapezius, if there's atrophy of that muscle, then we start losing that shape. The top of the shoulder can curve inwards, and our patient should look like this. So the next muscle to add is this green one here, this will be deltoid. And deltoid has exactly the same attachment of trapezius, just the other way round. So where we have trapezius attaching superiorly, deltoid will attach inferiorly. So deltoid will start here, it's going to have its attachment along the inferior aspect of the clavicle, and the inferior aspect of the acromion just here. We can see that medial border of deltoid of a fold on our patient, and that will pass down here, taking the muscle laterally out towards the shoulder, and then the rest of the muscle forms this nice curve that we should see on the outside of the shoulder, here. And this is the main muscle that's going to help us abduct our shoulder to 90 degrees. And as before, if deltoid gets injured, we can lose that shape. If a patient has a dislocation and the limb falls down, we can see this squaring of the shoulder as the muscle gets pulled down tight over the bones, like so. The final large muscle I'd like to talk about is this one in red which will be pectoralis major. Now pectoralis major have an attachment on the inferior aspect of the clavicle, but it also have an attachment medially along the length of our sternum. All of those fibres will pass from the clavicle and sternum, they head laterally out towards the humerus, and will pass underneath the deltoid to attach to the arm. Now at this point here, where pectoralis disappears underneath the medial edge of the deltoid, we have this groove, that line we saw before, and we call this the delto-pectoral groove. Now pectoralis major have two heads. We have one head that attaches to the clavicle, known as the clavicular head, 
And then we have another head attaching to the sternum, which in a feat of startling creativity is known as the sternal head. And then we have one last muffle that sits underneath pec major. It sends the finger-like projections to the upper ribs. And this will be ferratus anterior. And we can draw that underneath here. Now ferratus anterior, you can't see it very clearly here. But if we look at this picture of a boxer, you can see that muffle becoming more prominent. Have you thrown the punch? The ferratus anterior has helped pull the scapula forward in order to reach a little bit further. And that made that muffle stand out really nicely and really clearly. And so those are the muffles. Those are the muffles from the anterior view. For now, let's head to our posterior view of the figure. So we have our first two landmarks of the scapula. We're looking for the medial border and the inferior angle. Now, the way to think about this is remember that the scapula is basically triangular in shape. And that should tell us where the borders and angles will be. For the medial border will be just here, the inferior border along here, and the superior border up here. We have two angles, one at the top, our superior angle, and then this angle down here will be the inferior angle below. For now we can add our medial border running along here, and at the inferior end of that medial border we find the inferior angle here. The spine of the scapula, well that's going to be this large projection up here, the path is from the medial border, heads laterally over the shoulder joint, and finishes laterally of our acromion that we saw on the anterior aspect before. The occipital protuberance, now this is the bump that you can feel at the back of your head, so if you feel on the back of your head just near the base of your skull, that's our occipital protuberance. Then we have our spinous processes projecting posteriorly from our vertebra. And I'd like to highlight two of those vertebra in particular. Our last cervical vertebra, C7, which you should be able to feel of a prominent bump just where the figure of hand is here. And our final thoracic vertebra, T12, down here. For now, let's add these to our figure. First, I'm going to look for, I'm going to go for the spine. Okay, this is the easiest thing to find, the centre of the spine should be nice and clear. And we can see we've got a slight bend in that, and that will help us orientate everything else around it. Uh, I'm then going to look for my scapula. Now the medial border is just here, it's going to be that shadow, that line here. And that inferior angle is projecting out here. If I find that inferior angle, I follow that line up, and I know I've got my medial border of the scapula. We can then see this bump here, that will be the acromion. And the acromion will travel back at the spine of scapula over here. Oh, now we also need to add the occipital protuberance, that will be about here. Uh, the C7 vertebra is underneath his hands, but roughly here. And the final thoracic vertebra uh, will be about this level here. We can see the ribs coming up on either side to join it. Now on this side, the right hand side, Adding those bony landmarks with the scapula was fairly straightforward. The limb was in the anatomical position. We found those landmarks where we'd expect to find them. But on the left hand side, the arm has been raised, it's abducted above 90 degrees. And that means this whole unit, our shoulder girdle of the scapula and clavicle, will have to move with it. And so when we lift that arm above 90 degrees, that scapula starts laterally rotating, and our medial border instead of being almost vertical like this, will start becoming increasingly oblique. So to find that, I'm going to look for that inferior angle first, which will be just about here. And this line that's passing up from that point on an oblique angle will be the medial border of the scapula. The spine is a little bit harder to see now, we've got some muscles in the way. Uh, but if you look at the shape of this muscle here, that deltoid, and we've got a little depression just here. That's where the acromion fits. 
and we know the spine have to come back from there to meet this medial border, so our spine will be roughly here. So as I did on the anterior aspect, I'm going to start off by drawing trapezius, and we can see when we look at the posterior view just how extensive trapezius is, passing all the way from the occipital protuberance in the head, down to the spinous process of our 12th thoracic vertebra. So we need to draw this extensive medial attachment, heading all the way down to here. Now posteriorly it doesn't attach to the clavicle, but instead attaches to the superior aspect of the spine of the scapula. And that's the only place it attaches, even these lower fibres will pass up to attach to that spine. And we can see the shape of those lower fibres, the lateral border of trapezius just here. So if you add that line passing up, that describes the extent of our muscle. The fibres of trapezius all head laterally to attach to that spine, so from above they're passing down, in the middle they pass horizontally, and in these lower fibres they're passing up to reach that spine. Okay, next we're moving on to deltoid in green again. And deltoid mirrors the attachment of trapezius posteriorly as well. So deltoid will be attaching to the inferior aspect of the spine of scapula, heading out laterally along here, where we can see that shape, that shadow, and forming the shape of the lateral shoulder. Deep to deltoid, we have a few muscles that pass to the humerus, First I'd like to draw is this three-headed muscle that we find in the arm. This will be triceps brachii, and the long head of triceps attaches to the scapula, and then passes distally into the arm, down here, with the medial and lateral head sat deep to it. No, so all of this shape here will be our triceps. Coming off the scapula itself and passing to the humerus, we have teres major. Teres major will come from the inferior angle of the scapula, for so just here, and then pass to the anterior aspect of the humerus, for so popping underneath the armpit. And it's this bulge that we see just here. That will be teres major, quite a prominent shape. However, teres minor and infraspinatus that sit superior to that are a little bit harder to see. They're not as prominent, they're not as large, they're flatter muscles but they'll just be the fibres running underneath deltoid at this point here. Another group of muscles that aren't prominent, but can sometimes be seen if they're particularly developed, are the orange rhomboids passing from that medial border of scapula and heading superiorly and medially to attach to the spine. So they'd be about here. They're covered by trapezius, so we just see a small amount of those fibres down here. Then finally we have the large yellow muscle, which will be our latissimus dorsi. Like trapezius, latissimus dorsi have this large medial attachment, starting from the thoracic spine, heading down into the lumbar region and across to the pelvis. And latissimus dorsi will head from here, it will head laterally, it will follow teres major to attach to the anterior aspect of the humerus. And we can see the shape of that muscle, roughly here. At this point, it's going to be about there. And if it heads superiorly, it forms the lateral border of the chest along here. And then sweep from underneath trapezius, just underneath the inferior angle of our scapula. The fibres all heading up into the armpit, towards the front of the humerus, to here. And so that's it. We've drawn our muscles on the back. The final thing to look at is how these muscles are affected by the arm being in an abducted position. Trapezius, well that's the muscle that's laterally rotating our scapula, so it'll start to bulge up a bit more at the neck, and its fibres will become shorter and fatter. The rhomboids, which were deep to trapezius, and passing from the spine to the medial border of the scapula, will be stretched. The scapula laterally rotates, that medial border is pulled further away from the spine. And so this shape, this shadow we can see down here, that's probably the inferior border of the rhomboids heading back towards the spine. If we look at the muscle passing to the arm, 
Uh, we have deltoid. Now, this is the main muscle that was abducting our limb. So if it's abducting the limb, it's working. It's going to be shorter and fatter and more prominent. So this curve we have up here, that's going to be deltoid. We can see part of the anterior portion there. Remember, it's going to mirror that attachment of trapezius. So that shape has to come back here and to converge onto this point over here. As the humerus moves away from the scapula, muscles that pass between them, so things like teri major, teri minor, or infraspinatus, will become thinner and stretched. And similarly, as the humerus is abducted, latissimus dorsi will be stretched and pulled, the muscle will become thinner, allowing us to see the underlying structure. So here we can see the shape, that curvature, of the rib cage underneath latissimus dorsi, as the muscle is pulled and stretched. And so that's it, the muscles of the chest, shoulder and back. If you've had a go at drawing along, please let me know. I would love to see how you've got on. In the next two videos, we'll be looking at the axilla and armpit, and then we'll be looking at the muscles in the arm and the forearm. Other than that, thank you for watching, and I'll hopefully see you guys again soon. Cheers!